Hello, my name is Sasha Craver, and this is Legal Psych with True Crime MTN. Today, we are going to discuss David Copperfield, who has recently been Me Too'd. I'm joined with my co-host, Dr. Rachel Needle, licensed clinical psychologist and forensic expert who's going to help us break this down. Let's talk about these hefty allegations against the very famous magician who has been dubbed by some as the most successful magician in history. The Guardian published an explosive investigative piece accusing Copperfield of sexual misconduct against 16 different women sp spanning a time span of four decades. The piece alleges that Copperfield drugged three women, groped four women during live performances, and spoke on the phone with five underage teen girls. Ex-employees also claimed they were asked to approach attractive women at these shows and invite them backstage after his performances. He also possibly offered NDAs to a few of these women who had previously agreed to go public with these allegations. Copperfield's representative has denied these claims. I want to start off by talking about Carla and Lily. They have separate but very similar stories. In 1991, when Carla was just 15 years old, Copperfield gave her his number after one of his shows. He proceeded to message her and send her gifts, including sending her balloons on Valentine's Day. When she was 16, he left her a note saying, in two years, I will be back. When she turned 18, they started a sexual relationship. Carla claimed she was groomed. His team denied those allegations, um, emphasizing that the relationship was consensual. Now, Dr. Rachel, I find this behavior very shocking. Um, what does this behavior tell you about Copperfield? So this kind of activity in luring a minor is referred to as grooming. In this instance, the accused recognized that it was illegal, yet inappropriately still said, let's wait, but it's still grooming. So the issues of celebrities, including figures like David Copperfield, again, allegedly being involved with younger women, there's a number of different factors that we can attribute to this too. One, power dynamics. So celebrities often have significant social and economic power and influence. So that creates an imbalance in the relationships and that makes it easier for them to attract and exploit potentially younger women and less experienced people. Their status then, you know, sometimes makes them feel invincible or above the law. And then that, you know, further leads to more abusive behaviors. Next, we have stat social status and ego. So for some celebrities being associated with younger partners, especially those that, you know, are, are attractive can feed their ego. And because as a society, we often emphasize and uh, not emphasize, but prize youth and beauty. So that leads celebrities to kind of go for younger partners to maintain a certain image. Um, also access and opportunity. I mean, celebrities have greater access to such a wide pool of potential partners, including younger women. So their public presence can, you know, draw and attract and uh, the allure of fame. Uh, can, I'm sorry, their presence and their their um, their fame can attract and lure uh, lots of different people, especially those that are younger who might be dazzled by their celebrity status and sort of eager to to meet people that that have that um, you know celebrity status. Then there's psychological factors. So just because somebody's a celebrity doesn't mean that they don't um, have issues such as potentially narcissistic personality disorder or certain low self-esteem or needs for validation. So that can be something that drives them to seek out relationships with uh, specifically younger women. And then also, you know, I know we're going to talk later about the Me Too movement, but there is such a culture of silence and enablement, especially, you know, in the entertainment industry. We know that they've historically been known for a culture that protects their own and silences victims. So, you know, this enables celebrities to um, even prevent accusations or get rid of them or shoo them off once they are made. Right. And so he's kind of defending himself saying, well, she was 18 years old. We didn't start a sexual relationship until she was 18 and it was consensual, but that doesn't mean that she wasn't groomed. Right. Yeah. Um, so I want to move on to Lily, who has a very similar story. Um, Lily was invited on stage with Copperfield when she was just 15 years old. This also occurred in the 90s. Lily claims that Copperfield groped her breasts in front of her family, who were also at the show, sitting in the front row. She said that she has been plagued with nightmares about this experience ever since. Though there is no evidence that Copperfield knew her age, making a joke like this without express permission and in front of an audience is obviously some very shocking behavior regardless. Um, I'm surprised that more people weren't talking about it at the time. 
Dr. Rachel, do you think that the Me Too movement sort of paved the way for women to speak out about sexual misconduct after so many years? Yes, the Me Too movement, Me Too movement definitely paved the way for women to speak out. Um, it created a supportive environment for victims of sexual misconduct to share their experiences, to know that they weren't alone, and it fostered a sense of empowerment and solidarity solidarity among survivors. Um, and just you know, seeing other people come forward and you know have the courage to do that and share their stories, you know, helps people to then feel com more comfortable sharing their own. Not always but it, it helps. And it also, I think the movement led to a greater accountability for perpetrators, even, even those that were high profile um, and in different industries. And so I think at the, you know, nowadays there's more scrutiny for it, um, misconduct, and that also allows victims to come forward and feel more comfortable doing so. Right. Um, there are also allegations that Copperfield drugged three women before having sexual relations with them, which they felt they were unable to consent to. Um, once again, Copperfield's lawyers deny these allegations and point out that he has not yet been charged with any crime. Dr. Rachel, are you surprised that he hasn't been charged yet, given what we know? Um, because this is looking pretty bad for Copperfield. Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised. You know, investigations take time. And given that these accusations were from quite some time ago, that complicates the situation a little more. So I think time will tell. Yeah. Um, we also know that two women have removed their allegations from this story before it was published. So they initially made the allegations and then they decided last minute to um, remove themselves from the story. Dr. Rachel, are you surprised by that? Not at all. You know, speaking up in itself is incredibly difficult, but especially given the public nature and the media attention, many people prefer not to be scrutinized or spoken about. So, you know, I'm not surprised by this. It happens often. Right. Um, and, you know, as to your point, we've seen so many stories like this since the Me Too movement began. This one does appear to be credible, and it seems that a lot of young women were hurt by this man. Dr. Rachel, why do you think that someone would wait to come forward? Some are claiming, as have happened in other pro high profile cases, that these women must not be telling the truth and are doing this for different reasons. Maybe they have ulterior motives. What are your thoughts on that? So, and, and I hope what I say will help people to um, think twice before making a comment like that, because that can be re-traumatizing and incredibly, incredibly hard and hurtful to people that have experienced sexual assault and abuse. Many of these individuals never come forward to discuss their abuse or assault, never. So some do right away and some do over time as they have processed, processed it themselves or have the courage to come forward to them, to other people or sometimes to authorities. But there are so many emotions that come with even just saying it out loud. It's difficult to admit being sexually violated by a society who often shames individuals for it. And for others, again, admitting it to themselves can cause guilt, shame, sadness, self-doubt, denial, or even ambivalence. Even just the nature and the definition of PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, which a lot of people will experience following trauma, includes avoidance. So individuals will avoid talking about their trauma and any person's situations, places that will likely trigger a memory or reaction of the assault as if they might be happening again or as they remember it. And some of us might might have heard the term flashback. So sometimes that's called a flashback when it happens to combat veterans, but it also happens in other situations as well. So there's a lot of reasons why people might not come forward, including they don't think they'll be believed. There's a power differential between them and the abuser, which is often the case as we can see in, in situations like this, shame, guilt, fear, humiliation, feelings of isolation, and so many more. And again, sometimes they're just re-victimized by people's responses, especially in these high profile cases. So, you know, I think that the negative responses to disclosure can lead to a number of, you know, negative mental and physical health effects on the victims. So people just refrain from doing so. And so again, for those that say this is strange that individuals would come forward at a particular time, it actually isn't from a psychological per perspective as it's literally exactly what happens to victims of gender violence. Individuals are fearful of those in the dominant culture. And so we're taught to internalize the shame instead of putting it out there on our perpetrator. So please think twice before you make a harm harmful comment about something like this. Well, thank you, Dr. Rachel. That was some incredible insight. We want to hear from you guys. 
Please comment on this video. Let us know what you think. Also, please let us know if you have any requests for future videos. I'm Sasha Craver with my co-host, Dr. Rachel Needle on Legal Psych by True Crime MTN. If you like this video, please like and subscribe and we will see you next time. If you like this video, please like it and subscribe. I'm Dave Ehrenberg, AKA the Florida Lawman here on the fastest growing true crime channel, True Crime MTN. And we'll see you next time.